Good evening, and welcome to another edition of Making the Case. I want to say a special welcome to those of you who are joining me on MTV, those of you tuning in on Facebook Live, and those of you joining me on Freedom Radio. I thank you very much for tuning in tonight, for your viewership, and for listening in. Today, the Guyana Elections Commission met once again, and we are again nowhere closer to an election date or any confirmed timeline as to when elections will be held in Guyana. Last week, last week Tuesday, the opposition leader led a delegation uh, to the Guyana Elections Commission and they had a, a meeting that seemed productive when the opposition leader spoke to the media after departing the meeting and he said the statements made by the GCOM chair uh, were very encouraging and that she hinted towards elections being held in 2019 before the end of this year. Subsequent to that meeting, we saw a press release from the Secretariat at GCOM defending their March 2020 timeline for elections in complete defiance to the statements made by the, the GCOM chair. Now, a few days after that, we saw a delegation from the government side. Um, they seem to have run over to GCOM following the meeting with the leader of the opposition. You know, the, the, the government side is always um, two steps behind the opposition. We're always on the, on the front foot. We are always pushing. We're always on the offensive. And we always seem to know what we're doing. And we are often, most often, proven right in what we say to our supporters and in our actions, very unlike the government side. So they quickly ran over to GCOM, a whole host of, of the illegal ministers, the caretaker ministers. Um, some of them we haven't seen in a long time. They have resurfaced, such as Valda Lawrence and Kathy Hughes. We know that she especially disappeared after her uh, scandal with her awarding herself contracts, first defending that, defending her, herself and saying that there is no conflict of interest because um, the contracts did not come from her, within her own ministry. Lo and behold, um, about nine of them we discovered that did come from her ministry to her own companies. So they surfaced and they ran over to the Elections Commission to defend they, their position, as, as they put it, um, to the GCOM chair. And so the fight continues. And tomorrow is September 18. And we all know that even with the most generous timeline that we have given, which was from June 18, when the, the court, the Caribbean Court of Justice gave their ruling that elections should be held within three months. That deadline will be expired tomorrow, September 18. So even though the Chief Justice had ruled that the government has been illegal since March 21, that there is no pause button and that from December 21st, after the no confidence motion was passed, that the president and the cabinet were deemed resigned. And so in her opinion, in her learned legal opinion, the government has been illegal since March 21. But after listening to the, and, and reading the judgment from the CCJ and the CCJ um, making reference to things being put on pause because of the legal challenges, that the pause button was lifted 
on June the 18th. So bearing in mind that that was when the CCJ gave their ruling, and with the opposition being generous enough to then start the clock from June 18, taking us to September 18, which is tomorrow. So after tomorrow, um, you know, many people call, many supporters call, and, and, and many people call, call the opposition, they call members of the opposition, they call myself, and they said, you know, what's, what's next? Um, it is unclear where we go from here because we are in unconstitutional waters. These are unchartered territories. We have never been here before. The APNU AFC government, the caretaker president, has brought us to this point. Um, he continues to hold office in defiance of our constitution in defiance of a ruling from our apex court, and he continues to squat in office, himself and his ministers. And so, for the first time ever, we, ha we have an illegal government. I am not aware of any other part of the world where there was a successful no confidence motion passed in the National Assembly and yet a government refuses to call in elections. Even, um, even past President Burnham did not allow this to happen. He had the good sense and the decency, at least as much decency, to call and hold elections when they were due. As much as he rigged them, and we are aware of that, he did not allow his government to become illegal and for their status, their legal status, to be called into question. But caretaker David Granger continues um, to take us into uncharted waters and to squat in office. He refuses um, to, to give up power. Now, let us be clear as we have been many, many times before, and out of an abundance um, of caution, let us be clear in our minds that the Guyana Elections Commission is being used as a tool and as a ploy to delay elections further. So I saw the president come out on Monday, yesterday, to make a statement, a presidential statement, as, as he, he refers to it. Again, saying that he wants elections in the shortest possible time, but putting the onus and the responsibility of setting that timeline on GCOM. Now, I think most Guyanese are aware by now that GCOM is a constitutional body. GCOM gets its authority from the Constitution of Guyana. GCOM is not superior to the Constitution of Guyana. And the framers of the Constitution knew fully well that when they inserted that provision for a no-confidence motion, that three months is adequate time for the Elections Commission to be prepared for an election, even a snap election. And that is why three months is there, and all the previous elections, we went through it already. We went back five, six uh, previous elections, and I gave you the time, the, 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 the time frame, the timeline in which elections were held. And they were all called and held within 90 days or within three months. So GCOM is more than capable of pulling off an elections within three months, if they so desire. But of course we know that it is this government, APNU AFC coalition, that sought to interfere with the independence of the Ghana Elections Commission with the unilateral appointment of uh, Patterson. 
as the, the GCOM chairman. And that was all um, caretaker David Grange is doing. Illegally and unilaterally appointing the chairman of the Ghana Elections Commission without consultation um, with the leader of the opposition and without choosing from the list, and three lists in this case, presented by the leader of the opposition, again, violating the provisions of the Constitution that clearly set out the procedures for the selection of a GCOM chairman who must be impartial, who must be independent, who must enjoy the confidence of both the president and the leader of the opposition. So their actions are very clear and they have since 2017, I should say, when they appointed, when David Granger appointed Patterson as the GCOM chairman, since then, David Granger and Abnu had every intention of interfering with the independence of the Ghana Elections Commission and had every intention of tilting the scale um, when it came, to, when it comes to holding elections the next time around, which would have been 2020, before the passage of the no confidence motion. So the stage was set and they had it all, the, they had every, all the actors in place to do what they do best, which is the rigging of elections, because they cannot and will not ever win a free and fair elections in this country. So they continue to use one excuse after another. And GCOM, as you know, we, well, we, they utilized all of the, the recourses for the, through the courts and took us all the way to the CCJ with their ridiculous arguments about what constitutes a majority. And of course, they lost. They lost the CCJ. The no confidence motion was valid. And of course, they lost on the Guyana Elections Commission case. And of course, we know Patterson had to resign. And we had to go back back to the Constitution, as the CCJ said. They never changed the Constitution. The requirements are still there. It's very clear. It needs no glossing over. And on the recommendation of the leader of the opposition, we now have a GCOM chairman that enjoys the confidence of both sides. So tomorrow, September 18, um, after tomorrow, we, we have no, there is no president, there is no cabinet, um, there's no commander in chief. So we are in some serious muddy waters here and we are not sure how to navigate um, from here. But the People's Progressive Party will continue to do our part in highlighting these atrocities and in fighting for democracy and continuing to fight for democracy and for the holding of elections which are constitutionally due in this country. I would like to take this opportunity as I'm talking about um, the fight for democracy, I would like to take this opportunity to commend the um, members of the, the parking meter movement who have been coming out every week. They have a protest every Thursday at 12, 12 p.m. To, to 1 p.m. in front of the office of the president. They go out there every Thursday and they protest for an hour, um, calling on the president to uh, name a date for elections and to restore democracy to this country and I, I commend them for doing so. It's, it is a small uh, protest. I've been observing it every week. It's been growing. Um, but 
the enthusiasm is is not there and the support from all of the members of the parking meter uh, movement the support is not there like it was when they were protesting against parking meters and you know i wonder how they could have been so riled up to protest the parking meters but not um they don't have the same zeal to protest this administration that continues to violate our constitution um, every day that they remain in office. Nevertheless, the few members from the parking meter movement that are there, as, along with some other um, associations that have joined, associations calling for democracy and transparency, they have some young people with them out there. I commend them for, for coming out and for taking a stand. I also commend the Private Sector Commission for taking a stand. They are also taking the fight and calling on this government to call elections and to restore um, the rule of order, the rule of law. And, you know, it begs the question about where, where are the others? Where are the other political parties that say they are contesting the next regional and general elections. You know, where is Anug? Where is um, Schumann's party? And, you know, there's, there, there are a few others, a few other small parties that have throw, thrown their hat in the ring. Where are they? I mean, they are contesting the next elections, but they don't, they're not calling on this government to resign and to respect the constitution. So, where where are the backbones of these of these parties where is civil society you know where is the labor movement where is red thread where, you know so many organizations um that we can the, the human rights association where are these people where is the catholic church you know i am i am i am a catholic i can i can call them out i used to be so proud to read about the history of the Catholic Church's fight for democracy. The, the Catholic standard used to be at the forefront of the fight for democracy, um, highlighting the atrocities of the Burnham administration and um, joining the fight with, with Dr. Walter Rodney and, and, and calling out um, the dictators of that time. And, you know, they seem to have, the, the, the church seemed to have gone docile and you know, I, I, it begs the question as to why I don't, I cannot comprehend why these organizations and, and the religious organizations are quiet in this time. It seems to be the PPP alone almost um, who is fighting for constitutional compliance and the, the restoration of law and order and decency um, to this country. And it really, it really is not politics. We are not playing politics. This is not the time to play politics. This, this issue of non-compliance with the Constitution, of disregard for court orders, this is not a political issue. It affects all Guyanese. And our progress is stalled as a nation because for nine months now, more than nine months now, we have been fighting to have elections which are due in this country. And so instead of having conversations about how we protect our natural resources um, in the face of these, of the, the oil discoveries and, and how we talk about um, saving the other industries, rice, sugar, bauxite, and all of these things, gold. Instead of us having that, those conversations, instead of us going to the National Assembly and passing legislation uh, to protect our local content, to, to protect our natural resources, um, to bring relief to depressed societies, we are fighting for elections. And, you know, and we have to do so 
because the government is refusing um, to call to name a date for elections and hiding behind the, the behind behind GCOM. So for us to move forward, we have to first get over um, this fight. We have to have elections and we need to move Guyana forward. So the government needs to quit stalling and face the electorate. You know, if you are so confident that the last four years that you have done what you were elected to do, there should be no fear in facing the electorate. Let us face the electorate, let us have the elections. Um, all Guyanese need to call um, on the government, call on the caretaker president to hold elections. So we can get on with the business of governing this country, we can protect our resources, and we can bring relief um, to depressed communities. You know, if we, we, we keep calling on, on different organizations and we keep calling as well on the diplomatic community to come to our assistance. But really and truly, I tell you, um, my fellow Guyanese, that nobody, nobody will fight for our freedom and our democracy for us. We have to want it for ourselves. We have to want to be able to live in a free and fair society, a transparent society, a society that is, that is governed by law and order. We have to demand respect for our own constitution. We cannot expect the, the, the foreigners to come and fight this administration for us. We have to take a stand as a people not as a political party or political parties or segment of this of, or segments of the society we have to take a stand as a people as a nation calling for compliance with our own constitution the constitution that the president and his administration swore swore to uphold when they took their oath of office and so regardless of which political party you support, calling for your constitution uh, to be respected is, is a nonpartisan issue. It is an issue that affects all of us as citizens of Guyana and for us to be truly, truly patriotic, um, we should have no fear in in calling and forcing the government to adhere to our constitution. And so, like I said, the discussions that really what we should be having at this critical point in our country is about how we protect Guyanese, how we, how we protect our natural resources. And this brings me to um, the travesty that is now our local content policy. And I spoke a little bit about it last week and I just want to speak a little bit on it again tonight because I am so, so disappointed um, with the final draft of the local content policy, something that we've been calling on for since 2015 when oil was first discovered. And I want to draw your attention to an article written by uh, Freddie Kisoon on, on September 11th. And he said, we voted, we voted for this tragedy in 2015, the tragedy being the APNU AFC coalition. And his, his, he opens by saying, there are things that the APNU AFC government has done that are so sickening that only a sick mind would want these people to be back in power. And you know, in, it, that's in true Frederick Kisoon um, fashion. You know, he, he doesn't mince, mince words. So that was a direct quote from him. And he, he goes on to say, every citizen of this country should demand with emotional zest the answer from Trotman 
as to who ordered him to sign an agreement with Tolo for 1% recoverable royalty. He said he was ordered. He should have the decency to say by, who, by whom. And so this, this is what uh, we face. We have a local content policy now. We had two previous drafts from a CARICOM expert who had included provisions such as um, a requirement for foreign suppliers to, uh, before, I, before I, I go on to say that, let me just ask my operator to, to put this image up on the screen and you'll, and you'll see it side by side. So we have the, the CARICOM expert there on your screen on the, on the left. And provisions included foreign suppliers must partner with locals. Um, foreign companies must register a local company and must pay taxes. And three, that nothing must be kept confidential in these agreements. However, the British expert who was abruptly hired by this administration um, removed these key requirements from um, our local content policy. And so he removed the, the partnership with locals requirement. Um, he removed the registration requirement, which therefore means they no longer have to, they, they will not be required to pay uh, local taxes. And he proposed that local content reports of foreign companies be kept confidential. So, yeah, uh, thank you, Kevin. So that, that is what we have, uh, a travesty for a local content policy. It is outrageous and we should not, should not accept this level of incompetence. I don't know if it is incompetence on the part of this administration or if it is pure deception because you had a perfectly good expert who drafted um, the, the, who crafted the first two drafts, and then you abruptly um, installed a new expert to draft, um, to, to do the final draft. So I don't know what could have prompted that, but after reading this, I don't know how anybody from this government can sign off on such a local content uh, policy, even though we have been calling, others have been calling, independent minds have been calling um, for a strict local content policy backed, backed by legislation um, in the national past, in the National Assembly. But of course, we have no function in National Assembly right now, so um, there can be no legislation to reinforce uh, this this local content policy. So, and then of course we have the issue with Trotman um, admitting that he was ordered to sign a one percent um, recoverable royalty, which means it's zero percent because the 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 contractors now get to to recover um, that one percent. So we're really getting no royalty um, from the Tolo agreement and only this week Tolo announced a second um, oil find and we will also uh, not be getting any royalty um, from that. And so another uh, key, another important uh, requirement is that, not a requirement, but another provision that the British expert included was that um, foreign companies have uh, legal immunity, legal immunity for non-compliance with Guyana's regulations. You know, I, 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 that, that local content policy is, is a travesty, uh, should be shredded, and we need to go back to the drawing board. And Freddie Kisun, his last sentence in his article was, 
um, is Warner's third draft is so sickening that the only emotional redemption those who voted for APNO AFC have is to vote them out. I know I will. And that was, that's Freddie Kisun. And, and as you know, Freddie Kisun is no fan um, of the PPP. And so just as Freddie is doing there, I am also appealing to the Guyanese people to make, you, you, you have a very, very critical decision to make um, come the next election. And you may not like the PPP and you may not want to vote for the PPP and that is fine. That is your choice. You are completely entitled to have your own, um, your own opinion as to which party you wish to support and about whether and if you wish to not support any party at all. That is totally up to you. But all I am asking you is to sit back and to really take a look, take off the blinders and look at what the APNU AFC coalition has done to our country over the past four years and what they will continue to do. Because with the signing of these agreements, Exxon uh, Mobil uh, profit sharing agreement, the Tolo agreement, these, these decisions, these contracts will haunt us in the future. It's not going to end when we vote them out, um, when, whenever the elections are held. These, these agreements, the decisions that they have made during their tenure in office um, will continue to haunt us. We can't undo um, what has been done over the past four years, but we can try to fix it going forward. And we know, and I am confident in the, the PPP's ability to try to turn things around for the, for the betterment of all Guyanese and for the development of all Guyanese. And so I am very um, enthusiastic about the plans that we have. And I also ask you to take a good look at the proposals that we have begun to roll out and we will continue to roll out as we prepare to publish our manifesto. And, you know, the government and especially um, the caretaker president continues to be oblivious to um, the, the woes of our society. And we saw most recently his admission that he's not, he's not aware of what is going on and with the difficulties facing the mining sector. And so after four years of the mining um, stakeholders in the mining sector trying to get an audience with the president, trying to have a meeting with the president. He finally, um, over the past week, invited them uh, to a business luncheon and, of course, paid for uh, by, by taxpayers' money. And he heard about the woes facing the, the mining community, the deplorable state of the roads, the high increase in taxes, the, the lack of government concessions, etc., that were there before and were removed by this administration. He was then asked what assistance um, he could render to the mining community, and he said he was open to recommendations for solutions from uh, stakeholders in the mining sector. And of course, he said he was unaware of the issues plaguing the sector. And this is not the first time that this president has used that excuse that he's, he is unaware of, of, of something. Remember, remember when um, Dr. Jan Mangal, who was the, the president's advisor um, on oil and gas, when he said to the media that um, he found out from ExxonMobil that the, the new uh, power sharing, profit sharing agreement was signed. He didn't find out from, from 
the president. He didn't find out from the administration. He found out from Exxon um, that the new agreement was signed. And when he brought it up with the president, um, even David Granger himself seemed shocked that a new agreement um, was signed. And so it begs the question, you know, what does um, President Granger knows? What does he know? I mean, they talk about, I hear talk about him, you know, being called, um, he had a nickname in the army, Wonder Boy, and he seems to be living up to, to that nickname. You know, he, he seems to be unaware of everything. So what does he do? What does he do all day? What does he know? What is he aware of? And does he know how to fix it? Because I can't imagine you invite um, stakeholders in the mining sector to a meeting um, without first finding out what are the issues affecting the mining sector and then um, coming up with some solutions of, of your own as to how you can alleviate um, their troubles and their suffering. So you, you, you invite them and you go to them and you, you, you want to listen to them and then you want them to make solutions, um, to make recommendations um, for solutions and then you, you said the only promise you can make is to go back and talk to your to your ministers about it, you know. And this is 2015, all over again with the promises um, to do this and do that, and nothing, nothing ever comes out of it. It's all bluster. Um, it's just a lot of hot air um, by the caretaker president. It it was the Granger administration that introduced the two percent final tax on gold production in 2017, something that was not that was not there before. Miners now have to pay to sell gold, gold to the gold board. The 14% uh, tax applies um, to the industry. And miners who do not have um, claim documents are threatened with jail time and bullied by uh, government cronies who formed who formed syndicates, and they were allocated prime claims. Um, of course, we know under uh, questionable circumstances, and so these people are finding it extremely difficult um, to keep gold alive. And gold, as we know, um, was really propping up our economy. It is a main pillar. Um, a main pillar in, in our economy and it contributes billions of dollars um, to our country. So how can the president not know about what is going on in this crucial, crucial sector um, in, our, in our country and in our economy? And then we saw over the past week to the incompetence of Patterson again um, infrastructure minister on, on full display. We saw passengers um, walking through the rain at the Chadijagan International Airport because all four um, of the passenger bridges um, were down. So we have a 150 million uh, US dollar project and it's been dragging on now for years. The, the, the cost of this project is just racking up and you know we have not gotten value for our money this warrants a serious um, commission of inquiry that same airport project among many others that was carried out that have been carried out by uh, David Patterson the contract that the PPP signed to uh, for, for the, the airport, it was a fixed price project. Fixed price meaning that the contractor bore all of, of, of the, the responsibility and assumed all of the risk involved with getting this project completed. Um, you should have seen a brand new terminal. That was one of the, the provisions in the contract. Um, eight passenger bridges and a longer runway to accommodate wide body aircrafts. This government, as we as we learned, they 
they modified um, the contract. It's no longer a fixed price um, contract. They kept the old terminal. They simply renovated it, gave it a facelift. Um, and the, the four passenger bridges, the eight passenger bridges that were supposed to be there are now down to four. Uh, there is no viewing gallery. There's a, a smaller building that was constructed to house um, the arrivals. And, you know, the cost has gone up, but the scope of the project has come down um, without any explanation. And, you know, I'm convinced that David Patterson could not even build a foul pen, much rather um, much more a, a international airport and um, a new harbor bridge. So the incompetence of this administration um, continues to be on full display. And um, I have had a few things I want to talk about tonight, so a few more things, but I see the time is going and you know sometimes the hour is is not enough we can talk all night about the incompetence um, and the indecency of this administration but i want to hear from you the viewers so i am going to stop there for now and start to take your calls as soon as they they come in and um before we go on let me just say that they are, they are very busy now. So if it's one good thing that has come out of the no confidence motion is that the ministers who seem to have been in hibernation over the last four years, they've suddenly um, awakened from their slumber and they are now busy um, on their ministerial outreaches. And so I always tell people, I said, if there's anything you can get from them, go and get it, you know, because you're entitled to it. And whatever they, they, they claim they can do for you now, um, go ahead and, and take advantage of that. Uh, we have a call on the line, so I'm going to go to the phone lines now. Caller, good evening. Hello, good night. Good night. Sorry? When the what? Call, caller, are you there? I'm not yeah. hearing you clearly. Oh, the protests. Um, well, on Thursday, there is one in front of the Pegasus Hotel where the president will be going to speak to members of the um, manufacturers, Manufacturing and Services Association. So we're going to be in front of the Pegasus Hotel. We'll be joining the parking meter movement from 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. on Thursday. So this has been set um, as it relates to other protests that are going to be organized by the PPP. We will inform um, the public as soon as I have um, more details on that. So please listen out and we look forward to your participation, to your participation in that. So yes, we will certainly step up the protest actions now because tomorrow is September 18, and this government is illegal and unconstitutional and they are squatting in office. And you know, it's high time that the people of this nation get serious um, in demanding constitutional compliance. Caller, good evening. You're on the air. Good, good evening. Good evening. You know, um, the, 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 the no confidence motion, um, by the, this um, legal, it was being obtained by betrayal, you know. I don't think nobody like a person in the gang or in the um, crew betray them. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the caller says that, I assume you're talking about uh, Mr. Charandas, Persaud, and so he's, he said um, it was an act of betrayal. Um, but who, who was really betrayed? Because this government came to power 
um, promising a whole host of things um, and let down the people of this country miserably. They let down the youths of this country, they let down the sugar workers, they let down their supporters, the increased cost of living um, to an unconscionable um, level. And so the people of this country felt betrayed. They were the ones that felt betrayed because so many um, new votes they got in 2015, um, many of them, many persons, many of the young people who had never voted before, voted for the first time in 2015 and voted um, for a coalition government. And they were betrayed. And so Charanas Prasad, when he sits um, outside of his home playing dominoes in Barbies and have to hear about um, the woes of the people in the Sugar Belt, and he has to hear every day the insults from his people, his neighbors, the people in his community. And he has to sit and hear about their betrayal. He was the one with a conscience. He was the true patriot to go to our National Assembly and to take a vote for Guyana, to take a vote for the citizens of this country. And so some people may call it a betrayal because it is inconvenient uh, to them, but I think Charandas Prasad um, has shown more guts, more than anyone else um, I have ever seen, um, certainly in, in, in my lifetime. And so I consider him a patriot of this nation. Call a giving. Good night, Suzanne. Good night. How are you doing tonight? Fine, thanks. Looks so lovely. Thank you. All right. Uh, I think you're a national treasure. No, no one with what none of them saying. Nobody I listen to could articulate and represent and advocate for the poor people in this country. I would put you on par with Obama. He's the only man I saw <laughs> and listened to that could speak as well as you. I want to say as you as well as him. I say as well as you. Thank you. All right, you know, uh, the order that Trotman got, I think I know who the order came from. Uh -huh. That order came from the British consultant of itself. He got the order from him. Just like how the other oil contracts were signed, mm -hmm. they were ordered by the same oil companies to sign the contract. So when they said, you, you don't have to pray where the order is coming from. Mm -hmm. And I think you're very, very clear. Uh, the Catholic Church is that stood up to all the atrocities on the Mr. Burnham. Mm -hmm. And now they're so silent. Yep. But I got a little information for you. The mm -hmm. Catholic Church is one of the biggest shareholders in ExxonMobil. Right? You could do some research. And this government and ExxonMobil, what they're doing to this country, is criminal. Mm -hmm. And it shows the hatred that they have for the people of this country. Anyway, I want to read something to you, right? Okay. With such a partisan secretariat being a component of an institution that is supposed to be nonpartisan and responsible for the implementing democracy, then whose revis contents in the election will be at a disadvantage. So in the interest of fair play, this staff of this secretariat must be replaced with a more nonpartisan one or a more politically mature one, meaning they must be able to separate their political conviction from their professional mandate while dispensing their duties. Because with what we have, just a minute, yes. it's an election contest comprising of a, the PNC party, the government, and the GCOM secretariat combined as one against whosoever is on the other side. So whosoever is con uh, contesting the election, mm -hmm. they're up against the government, up against the secretariat, and up against the political party, yes. combined as one. Yes. Good night. Thanks a lot. All right. Thank you, caller. Yeah, so that, that caller certainly um, appreciates what um, we are up against, you know, as, as a political party. We're not just up against um, the, the present administration, but we have to fight 
um, for every single thing we have to fight um, with 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 GCOM to get them to um, follow the Constitution as well and um, of course with this administration it is an an uphill battle but we are ready for the task call good evening hi good night Susan good night how are you fine thanks okay um this government right you know what people always used to say pride go, goes before a fall mm -hmm. this government has pulled the wool over a lot of persons eyes yes you know first thing when i find that the ppp the opposition come with the debate is a way of getting them to get on their feet to find another tactic mm -hmm. things. and they quit the hall of god and all these things and all the perpetrators and, mm -hmm. and all those things but they have to realize that if you really look at them they're like wolves and sheep clothing mm -hmm. right and one of the things a government supposed to do is if they're building up this tactic because they deal with ordinary people on the street and the person that says, look how much things this government do, they build overhead bridges, they do things, build roads that other governments didn't do. But they forgot to do something in the equation. All of their building structures, they forget to balance the equation by building people in mind mm -hmm. and looking after the people's welfare. Mm -hmm. So they're not doing that. They're just building um, buildings and structures and and worshiping monuments and medals and all these nonsense and people mm -hmm. have the life to go on with right none of these projects like the projects you just mentioned building arches and, and building overpasses and all of these things none of these things actually have an impact on people's lives nope. um, on, on the welfare um, of citizens in, in this country and when it comes to the, the road projects, you know, they don't even have the decency to admit that, that the monies to do those projects were left there by the previous administration. That's so they have come with nothing original. Nothing. And they missed the part equation by balancing out by looking after the welfare of the people. You can't just do one thing, right? Mm -hmm. And then you're not looking after the people. I tr I've listened to, to a person on the street. When they quit for going to politics and talk about this government doing so much and all these things. But they, of themselves, are stifling the conscience that they're mm -hmm. being punished and yeah. they're not seeing it. Mm -hmm. You know? Because, as you say, pride goes before a fall. Mm -hmm. And I tell you honestly, God is a respect of no one. And God will take, um, he will take a, a sinful man and put him in position because his heart could be clean than a man who tries to pretend or be hypocritical and think that he would stay in position. Yep. Yeah. And, okay. and thank you for coming through, caller. You're welcome. And, and, and so we can, we can um, use the example given by the caller and, and quote scripture um, where it says that tax collectors and prostitutes are making their way faster into heaven um, than those who stand on the, on the road corners and, and yell, Lord, Lord, um, referring to the Pharisees, those who like to play that they are righteous, um, but their actions do not reflect their words, um, their day, your day is coming. Caller, good evening. Good evening, sir. Good evening. This is London plus this country already. That's why when you see the foreigner then come in there, they don't say anything. Mm -hmm. If it was the previous administration, they would have done jump down the truth a long time. Mm -hmm. And then they, they would spend the time and then say, but yes. this one here, they don't play they the country, and mm -hmm. they wouldn't say anything about it. Yes. Okay, caller. Okay. Thank you. Caller, good evening. Hello. Hello. Yes, I'm. I'm hearing you. Can you turn down the volume of your television? Hello. Good evening. I'm hearing you. Good evening. Yes. Uh, Sue. Yes. Hello. Good evening. Go ahead, sir. Yeah. Um. I would just want to compliment you for your job. Thank you. Mr. Doing. Thank well, you, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Uh, oh, shit. Nice dress. <laughs> Thank you, caller. Look, um, I want to make an make appointment here with you. Uh huh. With um, this election story yes. that we have here. 
Okay? Yes, go ahead. Now, these people um, in 1964, mm -hmm. they used to preach in the pulpit to have a lecture. Mm -hmm. If they want peace, vote PNC. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yes. They used to vote PNC if they want peace. But it's the same thing going around <coughs> with. They use this to make ballot box at GRB. The manager then was from Richmond. Mm -hmm. They used to make ballot box. <coughs> the person that made the ballot box, all of them died. One of them named Tony Singh, he alive. The from Richmond, the other people, well, if they don't work with the tomorrow man, they don't have a job. Mm -hmm. He gonna um, this this boy who uses to write the the people is them only the 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 ballot sheet them. He said he the amount he never vote, but the amount that he pull, he, more than the days he live he live. So I want us to very very be careful. Yes. In this regard, because if we don't, then we have our next kind of PNC story again yes i don't know i want to let the, this nation know that if you want to go back to gns story with people like alexander green where they used to rip those those girls in the gns place i'm saying this from people who from the girls them other people can tell us that they have to go through these things have them go through these things they wouldn't get a job tomorrow Mm -hmm. So let the people know in this country, tell them that if we don't, we go back to GNS story. People like Alexander, and you look at a man like Alexander, you imagine where he get. He get killed in front of him. Mm -hmm. You get green, them men mm -hmm. Even Bornham used to go send them to get young women to get them. This is things that I'm telling you that is confidence, all right? Yes. The young girls then that come back, well, we were friends, and they tell us, you have to have these things, mm -hmm. okay? I like the dress, so thanks. All right, thank you. Thank you for coming through. Thank you for, for sharing with us. And um, I am, let me see, I have, let me take one more call quickly. Caller, good evening. Very good night, dear man. Good night, sir. There's a renowned Christian preacher. Uh-huh who said that the pastors and the Christians we have now, they are pretenders of the Bible, mm -hmm. they are complicit and they are hypocrites. And when you relate that to a present situation, it's nothing but the same. Yes. Good night. Okay, caller. Good night and thank you for coming through. Um, that was our final caller. And before, I leave you tonight. As I was sitting here, um, a story came to mind, something that happened last year um, on uh, the day of the local government elections. And I was in a polling station at the Sophia Primary School. I went to visit and to check on our polling agents there in the school. Um, that's a big polling station. We have about eight polling, that's a big polling place, and we have about eight polling stations um, in that school. And everything was, was nice and calm there in, 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 in that polling place all day. And I remember one gentleman coming in to vote, and he was very noisy, and he was looking at the, the polling agent, the APNU polling agent, and he said, um, because if you remember, APNU contested um, on, its, on its own and the AFC went on their own um, at the last local government elections last year. And he came in and he was, he was very noisy and he's saying, he's looking at the APNU polling agent and he's saying, you know, this is the last time, this is the last time I'm voting for y'all, this is the last time I'm giving y'all a chance. And, you know, because I'm, I'm, I'm upset with y'all and 
Of course, the polling agent was very defensive and she was not very polite um, to him, even though he clearly indicated that he was here to support um, APNU once again, but that he was disappointed and he was shouting, you know, this is the last time, this is the last time I'm, I'm giving y'all the chance. Y'all better do something now um, before, before general elections. And I tell you that story because I don't want persons out there to be like that gentleman. I don't want persons to go to the polling station when elections are held um, out of some sort of, of twisted uh, loyalty or, or blind loyalty or feel guilty that they have to go and support the party that their parents um, or grandparents supported or that the members of their household supported. You know, we have evolved from that. And I implore you to think independently, to, to be free of any outside influences, to take a fresh look at the PPP. And of course, you can examine all the parties that are contesting um, the next general and regional elections, and you can make your choice. And even if it is your choice not to go to the polling, uh, to your polling station to cast your vote, even if that is your choice, and you no longer wish to support this administration, you are free to do so, but at least do it um, after independently assessing um, the performance and honestly assessing the performance of the APNU AFC coalition government um, and then making your, your decision uh, based on the manifestos put forward by the other parties um, and so on. So I implore you um, to think objectively, to think rationally, and to make a choice not only for yourselves, um, but for the future of this nation and for the future of our children. I thank you very much for watching. Please join me again, same time, same place, next week. Take care and be safe.